Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming today is sponsored by Awake Us Now. We are a ministry with a heart to see awakening and revival in America. Thank you for joining us on our two-year study of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is an exciting series that will truly help open our hearts to Jesus, our Messiah. And now, here's Pastor Dodge with today's message. Well, good evening, everybody. Let's begin with a word of prayer. And as we do, let's ask that God's Holy Spirit just be poured into each and every one of us as we study these powerful words from Mark here together tonight. Because what we see in this gospel is the shortest, most compact of the gospels, but a gospel that also clearly displays our Lord Jesus Christ and and just shows us the incredible things that he does. Mark, as we've said in the, the last couple of classes, Mark emphasizes Jesus' actions rather than just his words. And in the actions of Jesus that we're going to be looking at tonight, we are going to see incredible truths that need to be taken to heart by every believer and by those who are coming to faith as well, or those who are on the fence and wondering. There is much here for us this evening. So let's get started with prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we we praise your glorious name. Lord, we are in absolute awe of you because of your incredible creative genius because of your deep and abiding love, because of your mercy to each and every one of us. Although we, by nature, have wandered away from you, you have always come looking for us. And you came looking for us, especially through the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we see these truths this evening, Lord, and may we take them to heart. I I know, too, Lord, that we are going to be dealing with some very, very difficult issues tonight and issues that can be very controversial and very upsetting. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon each one of us, that we may receive what you have to show us in your word, that we may take it to heart that we may understand it with our minds, but more than that, that we may internalize these truths in our very souls, that we may know you as never before and follow you more faithfully in the days ahead. We pray this in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the risen King of the universe and who is returning soon. To him be glory this evening and forever. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, on that note, let's dig into the Gospel of Mark again tonight. And we're going to pick up where we had left off last week. I'd ask you, if you've got your Bibles with you, and uh, even if you don't, if you're at home and you don't have your Bible with you, now's a good time to quick run it and grab a copy, okay? This is from Mark chapter 1, verse 14. It's where we're going to pick up this evening. And uh, this is what Mark writes. He says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. We're going to camp on those words for just a little while now, actually more than a little while. We're going to camp on these words for quite a few minutes here. After John was put in prison, Mark tells us, the John, of course, is John the Baptist. And we know that prior to this, John's ministry had been conducted especially in the area around the Jordan River in Judea and and apparently also in Perea, which is modern-day Jordan. Uh, John was very bold in proclaiming that Messiah has arrived. It is time to prepare our hearts to receive him. And and John uh, John was willing to be politically incorrect. One of the things that he did is he stepped on the toes of the the ruler of Perea, modern-day Jordan, and Galilee, part of northern Israel. That ruler was none other than Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, the king who had tried to kill the infant Jesus. Herod Antipas had actually married his brother Philip, Herod Philip's wife. Uh, They had met apparently while uh, Herod Antipas was visiting his brother in the city of Rome. And and while staying in their home, he he actually seduced his brother's wife, persuaded her to marry him, went back and divorced his own wife, who was a Nabataean princess. She was... uh, She was an individual who was high-born, and uh, Herod sent her packing. It would later result in a war. 
But John the Baptist denounced that action, said, you do not have the right to marry your brother's wife. And the result is John got thrown into prison. We're told it was at that time that Jesus headed up into Galilee and began much of his ministry that would be carried out not only in Galilee in the north, but also in Judea in the south. I'm going to put a map up here on the screen this evening to sort of illustrate this. This is the area where Jesus carried out a great deal of his ministry. And in fact, although the Gospel of John gives us far more insight into the ministry Jesus carried out down in Jerusalem and in Judea, Mark concentrates especially on the ministry up here in Galilee. And this Gospel will focus a great deal of attention on the ministry that Jesus carried out, particularly in this small triangle uh, between Capernaum and Chorazin and Bethsaida. It, It was a very significant and strategic area where Jesus devoted much of his time and attention. Because first of all, one of the great highways of the ancient world, what was known as the Via Maris, the the way of the sea, came down from Syria, a little to the north of Capernaum, and then into Galilee, down the coast, all the way to Egypt. It was a major freeway of the day. Much commerce flowed through that area, a good deal of traffic. And as a result, Jesus went up to Galilee, but formed his headquarters. If I can put it this way, the headquarters of Jesus, Inc. was based right here in the city of Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee was in an incredibly rich region. Uh, Galilee was the, the breadbasket, actually, of ancient Israel, even as it's the, much of the breadbasket of modern-day Israel. Uh, much fruit, many crops grow in this area. It is a lush and beautiful area. One of the neat things about Galilee, too, is this is an area that has in many ways been more or less untouched by the rapid development that has taken place place in the state of Israel, particularly over the last 30 years. While large numbers of high rises and uh, uh, apartments have been built all over the, the, the land of Israel, up here in Galilee, it still has the look much as it would have in Jesus' day. There are housing developments. There are a few smaller cities and uh, kibbutzes. But by and large, it looks much like it did at the time of our Lord Jesus. But in Jesus' day, this was a bustling commercial environment. What we know is there were actually about 16 major ports on the Sea of Galilee alone. Uh, The Sea of Galilee runs about 13 miles from north to south and approximately seven miles across at its widest spot. But it was noted for its fishing industry. And and in Jesus' day, there there were hundreds of fishing boats there. Uh, In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that at the time of the revolt against Rome uh, from 66 to 70 AD, Josephus, who would later write a history of the Jewish people and a history of the Jewish war, was a general in the Jewish army at the time of the revolt. And he actually commandeered about 230 fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee and and used them as as vessels to fight the Romans. Uh, What's fascinating is that just a a short time ago, relatively speaking, uh, back about 30 years ago, Uh, A couple of amateur archaeologists, two brothers who lived in a a kibbutz on the the north northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee between Magdala and Capernaum, kibbutz Ginnasar, they found the remains of a 2,000-year-old fishing boat that goes back to the time of Jesus. It was a remarkable discovery, and and frankly, it has been preserved now. We'll look at some pictures down the road. It has been preserved. It gives us unique insights into the ministry of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, and it is a boat that would have been there at the time of our Lord and the apostles. It is not beyond the realm of the possible that Jesus saw that very boat. It's, you know... A slight possibility that he may have even sailed in it, for all we know. But this is the area where our Lord comes to really begin his ministry after John has been arrested. What Jesus does is he moves up north. It's still in the territory of Herod Antipas, who had arrested John the Baptist. But it's a long distance from the spot where John was held prisoner. 
We know Herod Antipas, when he arrested John, confined him to the fortress at Machaerus. Uh, Machaerus is a, uh, a, a hill that was built into a man-made mountain, in effect, with a, a, a giant fortress at the top. And uh, it's located on the uh, eastern shore of the Dead Sea, to the south of Galilee, uh, basically way down, on, down past the floor here. We'd have to go into the basement to get there on a, a scale map. But John the Baptist was confined there. Machaerus is in modern-day Jordan. It is still a difficult site to reach. It's a long drive if you're going from Israel or even from sites in Jordan. It's, it's kind of out in the boonies. Uh, but uh, it is, has a magnificent view of the Dead Sea, and it is an incredibly lonely place. That's where John the Baptist languished after his imprisonment under the orders of Herod Antipas and uh, at the, uh, the instigation of his wife Herodias. Anyway, Jesus now goes up here to Capernaum, and he begins his work in earnest. This is the way he begins it. Mark 1. Verse 14 says, he went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. That's such a fascinating phrase because it sounds identical to the words that the Apostle Paul would use in his work and ministry after his conversion. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 1, Paul talks about the good news or the gospel of God, the same words that are used here. This is God's gospel, and that is something that we need to, to keep in mind. As Jesus proclaims good news, he is proclaiming God's gospel. Jesus only says what the Father says. Jesus only does what the Father is doing. Our Lord was concerned in every way to make sure that he only did what the Father would have him do. And the gospel that he proclaims and the gospel, the good news that he is, it is God's gospel because God has broken into human history. And as Mark relates this, he is making it very clear. God has intervened in history just as the prophets had promised. And now the Messiah, God in human flesh, Jesus of Nazareth, real man, but also really God has come to earth and is going to proclaim good news. Mark starts his gospel that way by saying the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And now in the same chapter, he reminds us, after John the Baptist's arrest, Jesus came proclaiming the good news, the gospel of God. The time has come, we read on in verse 15. The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. These words are urgent words. And they were urgent 2,000 years ago. They are still urgent today. Jesus says, the time has come. The time has arrived. In other words, everything the Father has promised through the Hebrew prophets is now coming to fulfillment. The Bible makes it very, very clear that from the time of Jesus' coming, everything changes. The world has entered its last and final era of history, and that is the last days. The last day is when Jesus returns. The last days have been going on since he came and he began his work and ministry among us. Jesus comes saying, the time is near. The, the time has arrived. It's come. And we need to take that seriously. In his day, he was saying, everything has changed, folks. God has fulfilled what he has promised. Now, hear the word. To you and me, he says the same thing. The time has come. You see, this is such an urgent message that we dare not put it on the back burner of our lives. The message of the Lord Jesus, the gospel of God, is so, so important that nothing can get in the way of hearing and responding to that message. The time has come. That's true for the early believers but it's true for you and me as well. And we need to realize these are critical days. 
We dare not put God at arm's length. Instead, we are called to receive and respond to his message, the good news, the gospel of God. And here is the way Jesus proclaimed it. The kingdom of God has come near. <laughs> Love that. What it's saying is God has broken into human history. The Lord himself has arrived. What the prophet Malachi predicted, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly appear. That's happened. In Jesus, God has come down. And so the kingdom of God has come near. And, and what we are called to do is to receive that kingdom. You see, what the Bible asks of us, what Jesus asks of us, is not simply that we acknowledge he exists or acknowledge that the scripture is true. Even the devil knows that. It's why Jesus' half-brother James said, you say you believe in one God, you do well. But even the demons believe that, and they tremble with fear. Jesus is saying, the kingdom has come near, and the kingdom of God is within us. The kingdom of God begins in your life and in mine as we receive him, as we receive Jesus as Savior, as we receive God's word, God's spirit, and God's truth, and do more than just simply say, I believe you exist, but rather, I acknowledge you as my king. We are fiercely independent. But what God is saying is, you need a king, and the king is the living God, and he desires to rule in our lives and Mark is making that very clear as he starts out describing Jesus' ministry. The kingdom of God is near. One of the questions that each of us need to ask is, am I allowing that kingdom to take over in my life? Am I receiving the living God as my king? And am I following him? You see, what God desires, again, is not that we simply acknowledge him, but rather that we reverence him as our king and we follow him. Our mission is not to simply have a little God seasoning in life and then go on and do our own thing. Our mission is to recognize that God is king, that Jesus is the prince of peace, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and to say, I will follow you no matter what. So Jesus begins by saying, the kingdom of God has come near. And then he says this, and here now we get to the really controversial stuff. Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. That's what our Lord tells us, and it's not the only time he says it, nor is it the only time the scripture says it. I'll be very, very direct with you right now. This message is found all through the Bible. It was the message of the great Hebrew prophets. It is definitely the message of Jesus. And it is definitely the message of the New Testament scriptures. Our Lord begins his ministry the same way John the Baptist began. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, we read about John the Baptist coming and proclaiming that Messiah is near. And he says, repent because the kingdom of God is near. Jesus, in the next chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, preaches from the same outline and says, repent, because the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is near. Our Lord is saying that in order to receive him and in order to be genuine followers of the living God, people who allow God's kingdom reign into our hearts, it is absolutely essential that we repent. That is not isolated in the scriptures. Instead, we see it all through the New Testament. In fact, here in the Gospel of Mark, if you uh, go to uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 12, you'll notice when we get to that point in a number of weeks, Jesus will uh, send his disciples out. And what we read in chapter 6, verse 12 is, they went out and preached that people should repent. What was the message of the early apostles, the early disciples? Repent. Keep in mind, they were not speaking to pagan people. 
They were speaking to God-fearing, devout Jewish people and backslidden Jewish people. But the message was the same. Repent. And it's the message that all of the Christian evangelists and apostles will say time and again in the book of Acts. For instance, the apostle Peter, who is, we talked uh, in our earliest study here of Mark, uh, Mark is Peter's gospel. Peter is the one who shared these stories about Jesus, and Mark recorded them. Peter understood that Jesus' message is timeless and true. And so on the day of Pentecost, in response to the question, what should we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, to all whom the Lord our God will call. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Uh, Peter says, repent. If you go to the next chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John are used by God to heal a lame man who had been unable to walk all of his life. He was over 40 years old. And when the crowd gathers in the temple to, to see what has gone on, Peter responds to them by saying, repent. Acts chapter 3. On top of that, We see this message over and over again. I find it fascinating that in every one of Peter's recorded sermons in the book of Acts, he tells people to repent. The same is true of the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul speaks to uh, individuals in the synagogue in Antioch and Pisidia in Acts chapter 13, he he says the following words, John preached repentance Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance. Peter, who told people at Pentecost, repent, is now finding those same words repeated by the Apostle Paul as he goes to Antioch and Pisidia. And when the Apostle Paul goes to the city of Athens, he reminds these Athenians, these brilliant people, that God has called all people to repent and believe on him. The day has come. When Paul talks in Acts 20 to a a group of devout followers of Jesus, he reminds them as well that he has proclaimed a message of repentance to Jew and Gentile alike. When he's called to account before uh, the Roman governor Festus and King Agrippa II, he speaks once again and he says, everywhere I have gone in Damascus, In Judea and Jerusalem and in the area of the Gentiles, I have told people that they need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the message that is found everywhere in the New Testament. Yet one of the things that is very evident in our culture today, and I'm sad to say, very evident in the quote-unquote Christian community in the United States of America One of the saddest things is that word repent is looked upon as uh, out of step with the times and no longer applicable. In fact, one of the things that I've seen in 36, 37 years of being a pastor is that that word repent is often met with anger and hostility. I, I, I recall a number of instances, but one in particular where an individual got in my face and said, how dare you tell me to repent? What do I have to repent of? Well, that. <laughs> it's just that simple. You know, the Bible teaches that all of us have sinned against a holy God. All of us are in need of God's forgiveness. The great theologians of the Christian church for the last 2,000 years have understood that all of us need to repent. Martin Luther, when he sparked the Protestant Reformation by writing out a series of debating points for Bible scholars, he began the first of his 95 theses by saying, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he willed that the entire life of a believer be one of repentance. This is not something simply for the pagans. This is something for you and for me. Because God is holy. And his desire is that we understand that. Jesus came to a very religious nation. 
And he said, you need to repent. Repentance means being sorry that I've sinned against a holy God, not laughing it off, but instead being sorry about it. It means turning away from my old way of life and turning to God. Repent and believe the good news. That's what Jesus says. And that is for our time and especially for this day and age. You know, we look at the moral collapse of America that is taking place before our very eyes. It is something that has occurred in very, very rapid fire fashion. I have watched in my own lifetime an amazing change of the, the landscape in America. But it's also a change in the church. And today in much of the church, there is the, the attitude that, well, God's simply a good guy. And as long as I believe that God exists, everything's okay. Now let me get back to my life as usual. That's not what Jesus taught. And he is calling us to come to grips with the holiness of our God and to receive the good news of forgiveness and life in Christ, that the kingdom of God come in us. You know, he even taught us to pray that way. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. In the original Greek of the New Testament, that is a very explosive and dynamic phrase. If you put it in the Hebrew or the Aramaic that Jesus would have spoken, it is even more direct. It's basically, your kingdom come now. <laughs> now, let your kingdom come into my life. This is not something that we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. No, your kingdom come now, Lord. And Jesus is saying, take me seriously. Because the kingdom has arrived. Repent and believe the good news. On that note then, Mark continues. This is what he tells us. He says, verse 16, As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. And I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. One of the first things Mark tells us about Jesus' ministry in Galilee is that he began calling his disciples. And he begins by calling fishermen. You know, as you look at the Sea of Galilee today, it's a beautiful place. It, it really is. It's, I believe the prettiest sight in all of Israel. Uh, this, this particular photograph is one I took a, just a couple of years ago. And it was taken from a highway on the bluffs overlooking the southern end of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is actually the lowest body of fresh water on the face of the planet. The Dead Sea is the lowest body of water, but it's not fresh. <laughs> it's as brackish and salty as it gets. But the, the Sea of Galilee is the largest body of fresh water in Israel and the lowest body of water on the face of the earth. It is about 700 feet below sea level. Uh, it is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a, a decent-sized lake, actually, 13 miles north to south, uh, 7 miles east to west. Uh, what is fascinating about this picture is it really does give you a glimpse uh, of all of the, the, uh, the fruit trees and uh, other, uh, other plants that, that grow around the Sea of Galilee close to the shore where it's well irrigated. You can see the mountains in the background. Those mountains are, are part of the border between Jordan and Israel today. They look, as you see, rather barren, very much as they apparently looked in Jesus' day. Uh, the Sea of Galilee in Jesus' day was teeming with fish, a lot of fish there today, and, and great fa fish, by the way. One of the best-tasting fish I've ever had is a St. Peter's fish caught fresh in the Sea of Galilee and grilled on an open grill. It, it's delicious stuff. But Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee and then goes to the northern shore 
uh, to the town of Capernaum. This picture is taken at the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, just a short distance from the city of Capernaum where Jesus had his headquarters. It, uh, even today, you can see a good deal of crops and farmland around it. It looks as it must have looked in Jesus' day. And it's now at Capernaum on this northern shore that Jesus first calls fishermen to follow him. The first two, Peter and his brother Andrew. The second two, the sons of Zebedee, James and John. When Jesus called them, they were not what you would call backwoods fishermen. Many times we have the, the, the impression that these guys must have been poverty-stricken fishermen who were barely scraping by, and Jesus called them, and they thought, well, you know, this is as good as anything we might get in life. In reality, the area of Galilee, especially the area around the Sea of Galilee, was very well off in the ancient world and remained that way for centuries after the time of Christ. Uh, it, it was noted for producing fish that was shipped up to Damascus, fish that were shipped down to Alexandria in Egypt. In Galilee, they produced a, a relish that was actually shipped to, to Rome itself and was highly prized. It was looked on as a real gourmet food of the time. Uh, this was an area, too, where individuals were involved in international commerce, where they would have spoken not only the language of Israel, Aramaic and Hebrew, but would have spoken Greek as well because they had dealings with people from all over the Middle East and, and the Roman world. When Jesus went to uh, Capernaum and called these individuals, here is a, a photo of the northern shore right by Capernaum. I, I happen to snap this shot at a time when a, a group of Indian Christians, Christians from India, ha, had come and wanted to uh, get their feet wet in the Sea of Galilee, and they very graciously allowed me to shoot a picture of them doing that. You can see that the shore itself is rather rugged. It, it's not a black sand beach. It's actually a beach that's made up of small stones, small pieces of basalt that are found all through this region of northern Galilee. When Jesus came here to call the disciples, they would not have been standing in the surf like these individuals are. Instead, here's what archaeologists have told us about Capernaum in Jesus' day. What they tell us is that at the time of Jesus, there was an eight-foot-high seawall at the shore of Capernaum. That eight-foot-high seawall extended for over 2,500 feet, getting close to half a mile. And along that seawall, for 2,500 feet, was a promenade. And attached to that promenade were a series of piers that went out 100 feet into the Sea of Galilee, where the fishing boats gathered. This was a busy port. And Jesus is calling individuals who are skilled fishermen, and in the case of at least James and John, who were involved in a large-sized firm. You'll note that Mark tells us when Jesus called them, they left and followed Jesus, but they left their father and his hired hands. This was a, a good-sized small business, as best we can tell. And it's interesting, isn't it? that Jesus comes to these four individuals and simply says, follow me. And they leave everything and follow him. Because when Jesus calls, he speaks with authority. And when he calls you and calls me, he's not saying, well, give it some thought, you know, get all the pieces put together in your life, and then when you're ready, let me know. He speaks to us now. Why? Because the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus calls these individuals and they follow him. On this past Sunday, we talked about the call of Matthew in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. One of the things we commented on was the fact that Jesus calling these disciples is something that is unique. Scholars who have studied the writings of the great rabbis, the Mishnah, and uh, have taken a look at, at the uh, Talmud and the, the writings of Jewish scholars from the period and after, 
tell us that there is absolutely nothing in those writings analogous to the way Jesus called his disciples. What we know is that when the rabbis gathered disciples around them, the disciples had to apply to become a follower of the rabbi. In fact, in the Jewish practice of the time, an individual had to put together his resume. In effect, you had to prove you were a good risk and you were an aspiring candidate of great character with tremendous ability. And if the rabbi thought, yeah, this guy might work out, he'd choose you. Otherwise, you went away. Basically, you got turned down for the job. Not Jesus. Jesus goes to individuals and he simply says, follow me. He doesn't say, clean up your act first and when you've got it all together, then you can follow me. He instead simply says, follow me. And it's in following Jesus that you and I get to know him. It's in following Jesus that our relationship with the living God is anchored. It's in following Jesus that we are changed by the Holy Spirit working in our lives. You see, what we are reading here is not simply history. It is history. It is historical. But it is also dramatically applicable to each of our lives because Jesus is calling you and calling me and saying to follow. He doesn't say, you've got to know everything before you follow me. He says, learn of me. Follow me and watch what I will do. And I, I know personally, I, I, I vividly remember the call of Jesus in my life. I, as some of you know, I grew up in a Christian home. I can never think of a time when I, I didn't believe in Jesus as my Savior. But I also know this from the time I was a little guy. I knew what I wanted to do with my life. I was one of those kids that uh, you know, seemed to know early on what he intended to do. And it it was very straightforward. I wanted to become a fighter pilot. I was going to go to the Air Force Academy. And once they allowed me to fly, I wanted to be in a fighter jet. In fact, I wanted to fly an F-4 Phantom. Uh, Then when they wouldn't allow me to fly any longer, then I wanted to go into politics. I wanted to get my law degree and I wanted to go into politics. That's what I wanted to do. And and that goes way back into my childhood. But I still remember getting into an argument with my pastor over politics and deciding that I'd read the New Testament and uh, try to prove that Jesus would have supported my political views. I started reading that, and it was as though Jesus was talking directly to me. And you know what? He was, (laughs) and he still does that. And he was saying, you follow me. I vividly remember that encounter that changed my life and changed the direction of my life. And while God calls each of us to different things and in different manner, the fact remains the same. Jesus calls you and he calls me to follow him. For some It may mean staying in the job that you've always had. For others, it may mean a change in your plans. But I can guarantee you of this. Whatever God has planned for you and for me, he has our best and our eternal interests in mind. And we dare not ignore his call. Follow me, Jesus said. And they left their nets and followed him. Um, You and I are called to follow him as well. And by the way, if you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, that's fine to say, Chris, but, you know, I've messed up my life and I've been going through this and, you know, I'm struggling with these things. And not only that, if you knew what my childhood was like, and, you know, all of us have different things that we can say in response to this. But the good news is Jesus calls us anyway. And he's not saying you've got to measure up before you follow me. He's saying, follow me. And watch what I will bring into your life. Watch the power of the Holy Spirit that I will bring into your life. As we saw last week, 
John the Baptist said, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's what God desires to do in your life and in mine. And in following Jesus, he works miracles still today in our lives by changing us one person at a time, one day at a time. He simply says, follow me, acknowledge me as your king, and follow where I lead you. That is a great way to live. And that's what Mark is communicating here. He is not going into detail on Jesus' teachings. We don't know what all the conversation was before and after Jesus encountered these disciples. What we do know is when he said, follow me, they left the nets and they followed him. And it's there that Mark continues this account. Mark writes and he says, verse uh, 21, they went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. One who had authority. That is a word that Mark will use repeatedly of Jesus. It is something that he will demonstrate. Jesus has authority. And even when Jesus first appeared at the synagogue in Capernaum, the hearers recognized this man speaks with authority. And it's because he only says what the father is saying. He only does what the father is doing. He seeks and only does the father's will. There is authority there. The the Greek word that is used here in the gospel of Mark is the, the Greek word exousia. It is a word that in the first century had very specific connotations. It talked about supernatural power to deal with supernatural forces. The the Jewish people recognized the reality of demons, for instance. And they understood that without the authority of God, you could not cast them out. Jesus had authority. And people realized it the moment they heard him speak. No one ever spoke like this man we read in the scriptures. He had authority. And that's why he could call the disciples and say, follow me. And they did. Because they understood, even though they didn't fully comprehend who he was. And we will watch them as that comprehension develops as they walk with Jesus. But even though they didn't understand everything about him, they knew he had authority. And he has authority in your life and mine also. And that's what we see here. Jesus goes to the synagogue and he begins to teach and people realize he has authority. By the way, we actually believe we know where that synagogue was. I'd like to show you a photograph here, if I may. This is a photograph of a synagogue in the ancient city of Capernaum. Uh, You will notice this synagogue is made out of white limestone. It's a beautiful structure. Uh, It it was built after the time of Jesus. But but don't tune me out at this point and say, well, what good does that do then? It was built after the time of Jesus. This was built in the late 300s A.D. And uh, you can see a beautiful scroll work ornately done. Uh, this, this is a, a gorgeous building even today. But there's something else about this synagogue that is fascinating to note. And, and that is this. This synagogue is built on top of a different color foundation. And as you can see here on the sign, it says late 4th century A.D. white synagogue built upon the remains of the synagogue of Jesus. In 1969, archaeologists dug trenches underneath this lower layer. This is black basalt. And black basalt is what is used to build every building that we have uncovered in ancient Capernaum. Every building, every home from the time of Jesus that has been unearthed, and it's a large number, they're all built out of the same black basalt rock. But what the archaeologists discovered is that this beautiful white limestone synagogue is actually built on top of the foundation of the synagogue from Jesus' day. 
And when trenches were dug underneath that black basalt foundation, they found first century AD and BC coins indicating that this thing was built at around the time of Jesus or shortly before. This is where our Lord would have stood. And although we can't see the outside of that structure that existed in Jesus' day, when you stand there, you're standing where Jesus stood. And can you imagine what that must have been like to, to, go, to go to worship service and Jesus was the preacher? Uh, we know from elsewhere in the scriptures that he spoke there regularly. Uh, that, that, just, that sends shivers and chills up and down my spine. And this is where he goes. And people realize right away, he's got authority. But something else happens. And this is especially noteworthy and particularly needs to be internalized, particularly by 21st century American believers. Here's what Mark writes. They recognize that he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. And then we read in the next verse. It says, just then a man in their synagogue, verse 23, who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Now, there are several things that we need to consider here. Please remember how the gospel of Mark began. It starts out the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. Mark announces in sentence one that Jesus is the son of God come to earth, the Messiah of the Jewish people and the hope of the nations. He tells us that right at the beginning. So there is, you know, no doubt as to what this means. And then we go a little further in the Gospel of Mark, and Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist before John the Baptist was arrested. And what happens? The Father speaks from heaven, and he says, in effect, the same thing. This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Who is Jesus according to the heavenly father, his son, the Messiah, the hope of the nations, the one who fulfills everything the prophets have declared. Who's the next individual to declare that Jesus is the son of God? It's a demon. And please note where the demon is found. It's in the synagogue. Now, there is great importance in this truth. Because, you see, as we go through the Gospel of Mark, one of the things that will become very apparent is that the greatest opposition to Jesus comes from the synagogue and the temple. And basically, we're talking the church. I, this past week in preparing for this class, one of the things that I was led to do is to look at all of the times in the Gospel of Mark that the synagogue is mentioned. On the one hand, it didn't surprise me when I was prompted to do that because I thought I have a sense as to what I'm going to find. And sure enough, it's what I found. Here it is. These are the times that the synagogue or a, a synagogue or the synagogues are mentioned in the Gospel of Mark a total of 12 times. In chapter 1, verses 21, 23, 29, and 39. In that occasion, we have Jesus going into their synagogue. Please note that. It's described as their synagogue. And what happens? 
he encounters a demon-possessed individual who speaks out against him and says, I know who you are, Jesus of Nazareth. You're the Holy One of God. Because when Jesus enters, when the Holy Spirit begins to move, when God comes down, the demons can no longer be silent. It's just that simple. The devil is perfectly content when people claim to be religious. But when God's Holy Spirit begins to move, the demons have to change their tactics. And in effect, they want to make a racket so that attention is drawn away from the presence of the living God. And Jesus experiences that right at the beginning of his ministry in Capernaum. And he says, be quiet. And he demands that the spirit leave and people are amazed at his authority. And so the first time we see the synagogue mentioned in Mark, it's the place where demonic spirits dwell (laughs) in chapter three. Again, we see the synagogue. And in this case, the religious leaders at the synagogue are opposing Jesus and angry at him. In chapter 5, we see a synagogue ruler by the name of Jairus. And Jairus is a man who comes to Jesus in desperation because his little girl is dying. And you say, well, that's a positive use of synagogue. Not when you get to Jairus' house. Jesus gets to Jairus' house, and they've already got the professional mourners out there. And Jesus tells them, the little girl is not dead, she's only sleeping, and they laugh at him. The synagogue is connected at ridicule of Jesus. In chapter 6, we read that the synagogue, the people there, their hearts were hard. In chapter 12, verse 39, we read that the, the leaders of the synagogue were against and opposing Jesus at every turn. And in chapter 13, the last time synagogue is mentioned in the gospel of Mark, Jesus is warning his disciples that they're going to persecute you in the synagogue. Now, there are a couple of ways you can look at this. You can either say, well, that's a his- an historical anomaly and only applied in first century Israel. Or you can take the big view of history and realize that this has always been true. The greatest opposition to the gospel of Jesus, the greatest opposition to the movement of the Holy Spirit, the greatest opposition to the kingdom of God has invariably come throughout history from the church itself. And we see it here in the gospel of Mark already. It is not the Gentile world that is attacking Jesus. It is the Jewish world. It is the world of the synagogue. And if you look at the history of the Christian church and the Christian community throughout the ages, I'm sad to admit it, but it's true. The greatest opposition has usually come from within the family of God. Because when God breaks in, a religious spirit realizes, I'm going to be exposed. And as a result, opposition comes. We see it throughout the ages. I'm sad to admit, as a pastor, I've seen it many times as well. When God's Holy Spirit begins to move, the enemy pushes back. And when God's Holy Spirit moves in power, the demonic spirits reveal themselves. One of the most shocking things that ever happened to me is something that took place at a a prayer meeting in Pastor Phil's office several years ago. We were gathered together in prayer and and were there with fellow believers and and, uh, with with, uh, fellow uh, fellow minister of the gospel. And as we were praying, all of a sudden I saw something that until that time I had only really read about and heard from missionaries and seen in the New Testament. I wasn't expecting to see it in 21st century America. But as we were praying, uh, a pastor friend of mine suddenly fell to the floor, curled up into a fetal position, and began making animal-like noises. 
Uh, what went through my mind immediately was, Lord, they didn't teach me how to deal with this at the seminary. <laughs> And I I remember praying, Lord, please minister here in in Jesus' name. I I was with some other believers, including Pastor Pastor Phil and Pastor Kevin, uh, but also another believer who is very experienced in these things. And and I watched as he ministered to this individual. And, And the whole time, I am just praying, Lord, minister, deliver, heal uh, in Jesus' name. And all of a sudden, I was hit in the side of the face. My face was pushed like this. In fact, exactly like that. From my right side, I was pushed to my left. And there was no one there. I wanted to get up and shout, there is another spirit in this room. What I've learned in the years since is that when God's Holy Spirit begins to move, the enemy shows himself and pushes back. And oftentimes individuals can appear to be very religious. But many times within, they are bearing burdens and and are oppressed by spiritual powers that we often ignore in our culture today, but that Christians around the world realize to be the genuine article. And it's exactly what Jesus experienced. Because when God's Holy Spirit begins to move, the enemy pushes back and pushes back mightily. We see that throughout the ministry of Jesus. It's why in the end, the enemy motivated very religious people to nail him to a cross. They thought they had won. But in reality, God turns the tables. He always has and he always will. You may not see it immediately. You may not see it and an instantaneous way, but it will happen. And he will, he will defeat the enemy. As the apostle Paul said, God will soon crush Satan under your feet. And Jesus is showing that here already in the gospel of Mark. This is not merely a retelling of an incident that happened in our savior's life. This is instruction for us today. God's Holy Spirit is moving in mighty ways around the world. I believe God's Spirit is moving in our land. I believe God's Spirit is moving in my life and in your life. And I believe God desires to do great things. I also know that in our country today, we have wandered so far, so fast, especially in the Christian church, where we often embrace the vilest teachings and the most despicable of customs that have become acceptable in our culture today. But God is saying, I desire to bring my people back, to turn them around, to bring them back to me. It's why he speaks and says, repent and believe the good news. It's why he's always said that. The only thing, the only thing that can turn this land around is a movement of the Spirit of God. And that is what we are to pray for. That is what we are to earnestly seek. That is what we are to desire and strive for with all the strength that God gives us. God loves his children and God loves the world. And when you and I pray, Lord, send revival, Lord, bring people back to you, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon our land, upon your church, Lord, may a spirit of repentance flood over this land. We are praying in and according to the will of God and God listens to his children and he listens to our prayers. We dare not sit back and simply throw up our hands and say, the country is going to hell. Instead, we're called to be on our knees. We're called to be flat on our faces, humble before God, saying, Lord, please do what only you can do and bring us back. Beginning with me, beginning with me, Jesus called people one at a time, and he's still calling people one at a time. And saying, follow me. And as we follow him, he develops his heart in us. He changes our hearts. He gives us a heart for the Father. He gives us a heart for the Father's will. 
And he also gives us his Holy Spirit. And he says that anything we ask the Father in his name, he will do. This is what we need to be praying. We don't do this in our own strength. Today, sadly, much of the Christian church in America is trying to do things the world's way with business standards, doing things that they think make sense and asking God to bless. And what God is saying is, follow me and do what I tell you. We see that already here in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. This is powerful stuff, friends. And this needs to be taken seriously internalized and acted upon because Jesus call is still issued today. Follow me. And he says, when we follow him, he unleashes his spirit's power in our life. Well, that's where we have to stop tonight. Our time is up, but we'll pick up there next week. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend some more time in Capernaum. In fact, next week, we're going to spend time at Peter's house. Because much of the, the uh, work of Jesus that was carried out in these coming verses was carried out in the house of Simon Peter. And uh, one of those fascinating things that has happened in our lifetime, at least the lifetimes of many of us, one of the most fascinating things is God has uh, uncovered things that had been lost. And one of those things appears to be the home of Simon Peter. I don't believe this is an accident. We have discovered so many things in the last 50 to 75 years that have been buried for centuries. That is not happenstance or chance. These are the last days. And in these days, when God is calling the children of Israel back to the land that God promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and to their seed forever, He is also revealing things that have been buried for a long time. And he's showing us these are not simply stories. This is the genuine article. And God is God. And he's calling his children back to him. God bless you. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Father, thank you so much for these powerful words. Words written by Mark, but words motivated and inspired by your Holy Spirit. Accounts of Jesus' life told by Peter, but lived out by our Savior. Lord, may we take to heart what we have seen and what we read and what we hear. And may we hear your voice daily calling to us, follow me. Oh, Lord Jesus, do your work in us that we may carry out your work your way in your Holy Spirit's power. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. We hope today's message was a blessing. If you are asking yourself, now what? We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.